Well, I do so appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share with you today. Um, as I said before, my parents lived in Dalton for about the last 10 years of their lives, and my mom kind of grew up in this area, so I'm familiar with this area. Um, I do want to, before I really get going, just kind of build on something that um, I shared with the children's sermon, and that is the idea that God did, did not make mistakes when he made us. Um, I was sharing with Pastor Sheila last night that <clears throat> um, my dad shared with me probably just a few years before he passed away um, something that I hadn't really known, and that was that when I was born, he was um, he had a hard time with that, probably more so than my mom did. And um, it really was what started him seeking after God. My, my father was not um, a man of faith before that, and he had a, probably a, a bit of a drinking problem. Um, but after I was born, he really began to just ask, why did this happen? Was God punishing me, or what happened? And so when I was about four, some women came to our uh, door. They were starting like a church plant in the area and invited us to come. And my dad um, brought my sister and I, and he told me then, this was when I was like 40, he told me this, that um, the first question he asked the adult Sunday school teacher was, why was Linda born without an arm? That was really um, on his heart and mind. And the pastor, t the teacher took him to John 10, where Jesus heals a man who is born blind. And the disciples said to him, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither, but that you know, God would be glorified. And so um, I really learned that God used the fact that I was born without an arm to put a spiritual hunger in my dad that he would seek after answers to those questions. And then as a result, he, was a, he committed his life to Christ and our whole family was radically changed. So God does know what he's doing. We don't often see the hidden hand of God, but he is there at work in many ways. So I want to give you today an overview of what I do in the ministry of Capernaum. Um, just kind of an overview and tell you some stories of some of our kids. And um, because I work with kids with disabilities, I often, I really rely on visuals. So I have to use some form of visuals today. So I hope you'll bear with me because it's just, uh, it helps me to stay um, going in the right direction. So I'm going to be answering kind of the who, what, when, where, why questions. So our first question is, what is Capernaum? Capernaum is a focused ministry of young life, okay? So what is young life? Perhaps you've heard of young life if you, um, if you know Betty Papirio's son John is on staff with Young Life in the same area that I am. He's actually my supervisor. So Young Life is an outreach to adolescent high school kids um, to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And we're particularly looking for kids who might not be part of your church youth group. We're looking for kids who aren't really interested in getting to know God. They aren't really interested in God or Jesus, but God is interested in them, right? So we are out trying to get to know them and relate to them and, and introduce them to Jesus. Um, Capernaum is a ministry within Young Life that is specifically reaching out to adolescents and young adults who have cognitive or intellectual disabilities who need the same gospel as everyone else does, but they may need it in smaller bites or presented in a different way that they can understand and respond to more easily. Who is involved? Well, I'm the director of um, Capernaum in the Boston Southwest area, but really John Papirio, my supervisor, and his wife had been praying for years that we would be able to establish Capernaum, an outreach to kids with disabilities in our area. And then um, we also have college age and older volunteers who serve with us, and teen high school buddies who work with us as well. Where are we working? Well, we're in the Boston Southwest area, which is mainly the towns of Norwood, Walpole, Dedham, Westwood, um, spilling into some other towns 
as well. Two important questions. We're going to spend most of our time on the why, but I want you to hear how we do it. What is kind of the, the ministry model of Young Life? We follow in Capernaum the same model that Young Life does, and that is what we would call incarnational ministry. Now, we know the word incarnation from when Jesus left heaven and came to be with us. Incarnational ministry is when we go and be with kids, spending time with them, hanging out with them, getting to know them as friends, earning the right to be, to be heard, not just expecting that they're going to want to come to either church or to what we call club, but without relationship, they're probably not going to get to, to be interested. And if you think about your own faith journey, it's probably unlikely that you just saw a church and said, ooh, I want to go there. It was probably someone invited you, maybe a family member that you knew was there and you thought, well, I'll check it out. It was usually because of a relationship. And so Young Life really emphasizes that it's going to be as we get to know kids that they're going to want to hear about Jesus and respond to him. So in Capernaum, we hang out with kids. We um, you know, go bowling. We have coffee together, uh, ice cream. And we do also have what, what are more traditional program pieces in that we do a club uh, once a week where we get together uh, with a larger group of kids. And in Capernaum, that could be anywhere from 8 to 15 kids with disabilities on a Wednesday night. Um, and at that club, we have games, we have snacks, we have songs, and there's always a talk of one of the leaders sharing about a 10-minute presentation, usually from the life of Jesus, helping our kids to understand who Jesus is and how he makes a difference in our lives. We also have the opportunity to take kids to camp. And camp is a great place where we both have that one-on-one -on -one time with them, as well as they get to hear uh, the gospel presented to them up front at, um, at club every morning. But I want us to be think about, thinking about the why. Why are we reaching out to kids with disabilities, kids with cognitive disabilities in our area? And there are probably more than four reasons, <clears throat> but I have four reasons I want to share with you. And for each one, I'm, I want to share just a short story of one of our kids who went to camp this summer. We took six campers to camp and had an amazing time, and we saw God do some really wonderful things. So one of the reasons why we exist and why we're reaching out to kids with disabilities is because God loves kids with disabilities equally as he loves everyone. The most famous verse we could refer to, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's no exceptions in that verse. It doesn't say God so loved the world except for those with disabilities or whoever except for. No, there's no exceptions. People with disabilities are loved by God just as much as everyone else as we all are loved equally. And I saw that in a really beautiful way this summer in the way God provided for one of our campers. Um, Courtney has both cognitive and mental health issues. And we were really excited to have Courtney coming with us to camp this summer. And she was going to, all of our kids were pretty much one-on-one -on -one with either a college or high school buddy who was going to be with them. And so we were leaving for camp on a Saturday, and Wednesday night, my leader, my other female leader called me and said, I'm not going to be able to come to camp. Now, she was going to be assigned to Courtney, our girl with cognitive and mental health issues. And uh, my leader said, just things in my life, it's, I can't go. So I was, okay, well... How is God going to work this out? And my leader said, well, I'm going to tell, call Courtney and let her know that I'm not going because I think she needs to hear it from me. So about a half an hour later, I got a text from Courtney, who is very capable of texting and things, and she said, Maddie's not going. Who's going to be my buddy? I'm scared. 
And I texted her back and I said, I'm not sure, but I know that God loves you and he wants you to have a great week. And we're going to pray about it and see what God does. And so I was praying, John was praying, other people. And as I was praying, God brought to my mind the name of Aileen. And Aileen had been a buddy with us in high, when she was in high school. And she's now a junior at UNH in the occupational therapy um, studies. And Aileen is a committed Christian who was involved in Young Life in high school. And she was, as I said, she was a buddy with us. And she was actually in high school with Courtney. She was the head of Best Buddies. Courtney was in Best Buddies. And so she knows Courtney really well. So this is 11 o'clock on Wednesday night. I'm texting Aileen saying, I know this is last minute, but is there any possibility you could come with us Saturday for five days to Virginia to be a buddy at camp? She texted back and said, I don't know. I'm going to try and rearrange my schedule. I'd love to do it if I can. So we went ahead. We, you know, we talked on the phone the next day. I went ahead and made a fl plane reservation for her because we were all flying to Richmond, Virginia. Friday morning, about 24 hours before we were to leave, she called me and said, I'm a go. I can do it. Well, I really saw that week how much God loves Courtney because he rearranged things so that she had someone. And Courtney, on the way down, had some um, difficulties in the airport. She had some behavior that was difficult. And, but Aileen just handled it so beautifully. And because of that, Courtney just opened up. I, the only way I can describe it is she opened up like a flower that week in sharing with us about her family, in asking questions about the talks and about God. Um, the first night, so she and Aileen talked a lot on, in the car ride to camp. And after supper that first night, I was walking with the two of them, and Courtney says, so I want to hear more about those people who ate the bad fruit. And I'm like, what is she talking about? And Aileen said, oh, she, she asked me on the way down, why do bad things happen? And I took her back to the Garden of Eden and told her about Adam and Eve. So, so in all that week, she was just asking questions and really came to trust in God in a new way. And that whole experience was just a beautiful way for me to see how much God loved Courtney, that he went to extremes to make it possible for her to have someone who was going to walk with her through that week and answer her questions and help her to really know. And we were, we, you know, Courtney knew because we said to her, we don't know who it's going to be, but God loves you and he's going to provide. And that was a very tangible way for her to feel and experience God's love. A second reason why we share with kids with disabilities is because they need Jesus just like everyone else does. Kids with disabilities are not perfect. Did you know that? <laughs> they sin. They, may, they, they do things wrong as well. And, um, and they need forgiveness. And they need to know that God can help them in the areas where they struggle. I think of Paul, one of our campers who was with us. He has high-functioning um, autism or Asperger's, as it had been called. And Paul, one night, um, a, the guys in his cabin went fishing, and Paul was the last one to catch a fish. And this was really upsetting for Paul. And he ended up in a major meltdown, because then he was like, well, I didn't really want to go fishing anyway, and you made me go. And so all this anger came out of him. And um, we were able to just really talk with him about, you know, Paul, God can help you with this. This is you, And his anger at his parents and anger at people who have made fun of him over the years. And we just saw a lot of hurt in Paul. But also we're able to say, you know, Paul, God loves you and he wants to help you. He can help you to control your anger. He can help you to see the good things that he's doing in his life, in your life. So people with disabilities need Jesus. And that brings us back to Matthew 28, 18 to 20, which I read to you. Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go into all the world and make disciples, no exceptions doesn't say, well, but some people don't need this. Everyone needs to know who Jesus is and what he's done 
so that they can be forgiven and know that he's with them in their life. Another reason, and let me I just turn to the passage I want to read to you, that we share with people with disabilities is because they can grow in their faith as well. People with disabilities can grow in their faith. And there's a passage that I really love in Colossians 1 that describes what it looks like to be a growing Christian. And um, let me read this to you. It says, and we pray this, this is Paul talking about how he's praying for the Colossian church. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Colon. In other words, this is what it's going to look like to live a life pleasing to the Lord. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. To me, this verse says, these are the things that it looks, this is what it looks like to be growing and pleasing God. It's not being able to explain your theology. It's not having so much scripture memorized. Those things can help you, but that's not what the requirements are. These are things that a person with disabilities, a person, a child, an elderly person, any of us can do these things, and they are good works, bearing fruit in good works, growing in the knowledge of God, getting to know him better, being patient and enduring, and joyfully giving thanks. And we see that in our kids at Capernaum. They can grow in their faith. One of the, um, the most poignant moments for me at camp this year was when Katie, who um, Katie is, has been with us since the start of Capernaum, she has Down syndrome, and she and her buddy were in the bookstore, in the gift shop, and Katie was over looking at the books. Now, unfortunately, they don't seem to put books during the week of Capernaum that would be kind of um, at the more reading level that our kids are at. So she had picked up this book by Tim Keller, I think it was called Christ the King, and she's looking at it, and then she's in her wallet trying to see if she has enough money to buy it. And I was just standing there thinking, now here she is. She hasn't gone looking. Her first choice is not to get a t-shirt for herself. She's not looking at a new mug. She's looking for a book that will help her to get to know who Jesus is. And even though it's a book that probably is reading way beyond her, that showed me where her heart was. She wants to know Jesus, the King. And so um, I you know, was able to just say, Katie, I'm so excited. This is how you want to spend your money. Let me help you find something that might be a little bit easier to read. But her heart was to know Jesus, and that to me is evidence of growth. So kids with disabilities can grow in their faith and in their relationship with Jesus just like everyone else does. And the last reason we want to be sharing is because they have gifts to share with us. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how each part of the body needs each other and how God has placed gifts in the body as he wants. And our kids with disabilities, adults with disabilities, have gifts that the body of Christ needs. And I saw this so beautifully in one of our kids, John, at camp. John also has Down syndrome. He is very outgoing. He is what we consider our ideal camper in that he is so enthusiastic about everything that happens at camp. But he's also very um, gentle and caring and noticing what's going on with other kids. And his um, leader, Max, had told me that John had really been, been helpful in the cabin with Jonah, one of our other kids, who is um, severely autistic and very limited in conversation. And um, so one morning, I was sitting at breakfast with John and Jonah. And John was serving Jonah his scrambled eggs. But as he was doing it, he was chatting away with Jonah, saying, you know, Jonah, do you want some more? Oh, uh, you want some ketchup? I love ketchup on my eggs. And Jonah was sitting there, who doesn't talk much, and he was just giggling. 
just giggling as John was chatting away with him. And I thought, as I watched, I thought, you know, I don't think many peers try to interact with Jonah because he, he doesn't really respond. And so adults try, sometimes we try unsuccessfully, but John was just, he didn't care whether Jonah responded or not. He was just chatting away with him as a friend. And I think Jonah knew, hey, this is a friend. And he was just sitting there like, oh, this is so fun to have this kid talking with me and helping, with me, helping me. John was bringing his gifts to the rest of the body. So this is why we share. And this is really why we would share with anyone, isn't it? Because God loves people equally because people need Jesus equally, because people have the potential to grow. And it's going to look different in our kids with disabilities. They're not going to be able to maybe explain things the way you or I might be able to, but they show Jesus in their heart and in the way they respond. And because they have gifts to bring us, each person, if they have the Holy Spirit living in them, has something to share with the rest of the body of Christ. So in closing, I just want to encourage you, how can you help us? Well, you can pray for Young Life Capernaum. In the fellowship hall, I have a sheet of paper. Um, I send out a monthly prayer update. Just one sheet, email, or I can send it to you by print if you don't do email. Um, just telling you what's going on and how you can pray. If you'd like to do that, I would love to add you to our prayer update list. Um, if you're interested in giving to the ongoing needs, I'm on part-time staff, so I do get a salary, and then there are needs of sending kids to camp, buying supplies for camp. Um, I think I might have some business cards with, my, uh, with our website that you could um, link to, or you could ask me for how to do that. Um, but the most, I guess the thing I'd like to ask you to do, to think about, is how can you reach out in your own community, in your own circle of friends and family, to both people with disabilities and other people, recognizing that all people are loved by God, need him, they can grow, and they have gifts to share. Who can you reach out to? Is there a person with disabilities that maybe you thought, well, I don't know what to say to them, or they wouldn't be interested, or how would, it, how would it work? Trust God that he has a purpose for them, and he might want to use you in the process of reaching out to them. So thank you. Let me, I'd like to just close in prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege that you've given me to hang out with these kids through Capernaum and learn from them. And I thank you for the opportunity to share with this congregation today. Lord, I pray that you would make us more and more aware of how much you love people and how much you want them in your family and then what they have to bring to us. So I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us today, that we would truly go into all the world and make disciples right where we are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for the message. Thank you for giving us the charge, amen, to go out and make disciples because we are all